I was planning on talking to everyone from my office, um, but I've been waiting on this call. Um, we do, my nonprofit is Urban Success. We work extremely hard to end domestic violence and human trafficking for individuals, for families. That includes a lot of people. You know, anyone going through domestic violence or trafficking usually has a family, usually has somebody grieving them or stressing over them. So um, it's not just that person, it's, you know, quite a, a few different people. Um, we started doing what we do back in. I started it in 2000, actually, as a gang intervention program because I'm a sign language interpreter by profession, and God put me in an inner city school, a really rough inner city school, um, gang infested, of course. Um, and so I noticed the issues going on in the school and the people, um, the kids, they're just stressed out, but for whatever reason they took to me. So um, it ended up working out in my favor. Um, those kids, those gang members grew up and they began helping me basically rescue our clients today. So um, that's what I'm doing at the moment in a sense. Um, our client got out. He is a disabled veteran um, who is leaving his very abusive wife. Believe it or not, we do get a couple men who are victims of domestic violence looking for assistance, uh, which is so exciting when we get that call because a lot of times men feel like they can't tell anybody anything, that they can't, um, they just have to put up with it and that it becomes normal for them. So I'm happy that he finally reached out um, about an hour and a half ago and said he was done, he's leaving. Um, and he was not at home. Um, so I was able to meet him and we were to go get his stuff, go get some of his stuff. Um, the gang members I worked with back in the beginning helped me get away from an abusive husband. So I, I kind of joke, but it's serious that I was our first rescue. Um, and from there we realized, wow, there's gotta be a lot more people out here who, who are in the same situation and don't know how to get away and don't have friends like this who can protect them and step in for them and help them. So we started putting the word out like, hey, if you if you know somebody just in trouble or who needs assistance, call us. And they, they started calling. So it grew, it just kind of exploded. And then probably about maybe 12, 13 years ago, um, we encountered our first human trafficking victim. Um, someone who was trafficked from the age of five to 17 by every male in her family, um, shared outside of her family as well. And that was just like a, a I mean, wow, that was a life-changing experience for us. We knew that Urban Success had to go in a new direction with that. And once we started looking into human trafficking more, we realized that you know, it's a $150 billion a year global business. No community is untouched from it, no matter where you live. The United States is the number one purchaser and producer of child rape videos in the world. Um, it, it's just, it's incredible that the things that, you know, we see here, if you take this training and explore more in your area, you know, you'll probably notice some things differently. You'll look at your community differently and people differently as you go out and about. Um, but she really, really opened our eyes, changed everything for us. Um, I realized there's a lack of resources. There's a lack of information. Um, there's not a lot out there that um, is truly helpful long-term. And what is out there gets filled up very quickly because you're talking about millions of victims. Um, a lot of these children who are taken are taken very young. You have about a six to seven year lifespan once you are taken, if it is for the purpose of sex trafficking. There are three different kinds of trafficking that we deal with. Um, we don't deal with labor trafficking a lot. That's basically where someone from another country will bring someone from that country over here, get them a visa or whatnot, hang on to their passport, hang on to their work visa, 
start charging them for shelter on top of all the bills they already accumulated to get here. And basically they never, um, they never get the debt paid off. They got to work it off and work it off and work it off. That's um, a very brief labor trafficking description. Um, I actually know a survivor of labor trafficking. Um, and then there's of course the um, sex trafficking. Um, that's our biggest thing we're seeing with children to adults. Um, by the age of 19, 20, you're pretty much too old. You, you have to look extremely young um, to be taken for the purpose of sex trafficking. And at that age, they will start phasing you out, which does not end well. Um, it's usually, it usually ends with death. But um, another form of trafficking obviously is picking up called organ harvesting. And that is just what it says. They're taking organs out of anybody. Um, we have a homeless outreach program within Urban Success, and we had a gentleman a couple years ago. He had my phone number. He called me, and I really, I blew him off for probably the first half hour because I thought he was drunk. Like, there's no way, you know, there's no way somebody's taking you, you know, for what? And he says, yeah, I, I've got day labor, I've got day work from these guys. They said they'd pay me to help them with some stuff. And I said, okay, great, you know? He's like, no, not great. I am in the trunk of the car and we're headed to Chicago. And I got chills because Chicago is kind of like um, the, the focal point of organ harvesting. That's where a lot of it happens. So I knew very quickly that we would have to intercept him. Um, and he was able to get on Facebook yes, from the trunk and ping his location, you know, set his location for me. And as soon as I got his location, I was able to, to send our team as well as the authorities up there and they were able to recover him. Um, and it, it was just a whole operation running out of a rundown, shut down motel. Um, for whatever reason, it just always seems to be a, a rundown motel that you think is out of business and it's not. So, um, got him back and that was nice because <laughs> he's, you know, he went through some therapy. He was a little traumatized to be honest. Um, but we do see organ harvesting picking up and with that, they don't care what your age is, what your gender is, what you look like. If they think you have something that would sell on the black market easily, like a kidney or something, they, they could attempt to take it. Um, there are, there's some resources out there, they're growing, there's awareness growing, but it's not enough. We need people to have a safety plan. Whenever you, I go out with my kids, we have a safety plan. Um, for example, I don't use their real first names. I'll call them by a middle name. My kids have multiple names. So I'll call them by one of their middle names. And that way, if somebody comes up to them and if we're separated for whatever reason, somebody comes up to them and uses that name, they can't give my child their first name because they don't know it. Like, oh, your mom said, come with me. Well, what's my first name? They have no clue. So my child knows that I did not send that person. Um, also, I park right next to the cart corral. Um, you know, because I want to put my kids in and out of the car safely. They're young, they're eight, nine, and now 11. Um, I want to get them in and out of the car and um, lock them in. And then I load the car because some people are approached at stores. Um, I'm sitting in a community right now that's famous for it. Um, they are being approached and people will walk right up to your car and kind of pin you in the car. So you have to be very careful. Um, Let's see, goodness, I have so much to tell you. <laughs> I was really thrown off by, uh, by going on this, this assignment tonight. Um, but trafficking in general is growing. You have got to keep aware. You've got to watch your family, your, your friends, kids, neighbor kids. If you see anything that doesn't look right, doesn't feel right, you know, ask if someone's okay. You know, sometimes that's all it takes is a waitress will ask somebody at a restaurant, are you okay? And the next thing I know, I'm getting a phone call that this, this person is, is not okay and they need help there. So um, in your local community, you should have, or close by hopefully, a Salvation Army. 
um, they are very active in human trafficking. Um, they are, oh my gosh, they just do a whole lot of good for trafficking victims. Um, I believe they work with another huge global organization called Operation Underground Railroad. Um, that is one that will go into foreign countries. Um, Tim Ballard runs that. They'll go into foreign countries. They will um, um, you know, go undercover or they'll just flat out buy the children back and you know, give them someplace safe to live, teach them life skills, help them heal. There's a lot that goes into the healing process. It's the rescue part can get sticky, can get dangerous, but that's almost the easy part because you've got to have a place to house these people. Where can they live? They cannot go back to their environments, especially if that environment is in is where they were taken from, they can be found again. Um, you don't want any elements around them that could influence them, um, you know, or, or trigger them either. So they need long-term housing. They need medical attention first and foremost. So when we go to get someone, we immediately take them to the ER and make sure that they don't have, which they usually do, multiple STDs, broken bones, um, any kind of physical injury. And then because they're all given drugs, either meth, heroin, a mixture of both, um, um, we have to get them into a detox facility, but it has to be trafficking trained. And that's the issue. That's what I really need all of you to help with is reach out to your communities, educate them, let them know that trafficking is not prostitution. Trafficking is, it, it's a different direction, a different avenue than really anything, um, anything else. So, um, these emergency rooms, detox facilities, uh, treatment centers, group homes, residential places, we need more of them for trafficking survivors by trafficking survivors. You know, the women on my team are trafficking survivors. Um, so they, they know what, what is out there and they know how to help us navigate when we're doing things. They can't go with us right now. Um, They've never gone with us, but they'll say, yeah, this means this, or this means that, or look for this symbol, or, um, you know, here's a place close by that you can take her um, or him, because there's little boys involved as well. Um, so um, just find out what's available in your area. Find out how you can get involved. Keep your eyes open. Create a safety plan with your family, your friends. Um, kids you work with, um, just make sure that you're always alert. You're always aware because it will happen at the funniest time. I mean, the, the craziest times you'll notice something. Um, and it could be the one little thing that could save someone's life. So that's kind of what I, what I'm hoping to do through talking to people through doing more outreach is getting people aware and thinking while they're out and about and knowing what to look for, um, seeing what's in your area. And if there's nothing in your area, create something, bring something there. Um, do something so that, you know, people know there's a resource. My resources are not for all 50 states. I, I'm working on it. I've got some stuff on my website that is national. And then by my home state and the states around us, I'm working on some different states, compiling information, whatever you have, please send it to me. I'll add it to our website um, because that's the first thing I do is tell a lot of people, you know, if you're interested or you need resources somewhere, go to my website, look for this, this, and this. Um, but one of the best resources ever is gonna always probably be the Salvation Army as well as your state attorney general. They have an anti-human trafficking task force. The attorney general in every state is responsible for spearheading that and running that. So find out who is involved in your anti-human trafficking task force. What are they doing? I know here in Ohio, they're very aggressive. Um, they're very aggressive and they have no problem humiliating the Johns, the buyers of these trafficking victims. Um, it's beautiful, really. Um, they will literally put their name and face on a billboard in some of our cities and publicly humiliate them. 
um, so that everybody knows. But that brings me to another point. We have to, at some point, start having hard conversations with people we know, particularly white middle-aged men with disposable income. That's your standard, typical trafficking buyer. Um, who do you know that is addicted to porn? Who do you know that favors young looking girls? Who do you know who's always got a kid on his lap or joking around about something um, inappropriate? Think about who you go to church with, who do you work with, who's in your family that may have struggled with addiction of any kind, but especially porn, because the porn addiction is fueling the trafficking. Um, there's a dark web out there that is, you know pretty much keeping this going and feeding these addictions and it's damaging if not killing the victims of these videos so um it's hard to have these conversations sorry the minute i'm not available somebody needs me <laughs> um but it's very important to start having these conversations um we work well together my team does there's ways that you can find like-minded people. Maybe there's someone who, who's had it on their heart for a long time to reach out and see what's out there. Um, sometimes we just take soaps that have my Google Voice phone number on it to different motels, um, bars, truck stops, uh, rest areas, strip clubs, anywhere that we know that trafficking has happened or could potentially happen. And we just say, hey, can we give this out? Could you give this soap to, you know, anybody that may need some help? And many times that turns into an outreach because the people we give the soap to will say, yeah, that room over there or go to room 234. They're always fighting up there. She's always screaming at him. You know, I've had to call the cops a couple of times or something. So be, have a plan, have some training and be ready to help people instantly um, you know, because you never know, it could go from something very, you know, random, like handing out soap to, okay, now I've got somebody in my car and I'm going to the hospital with them. So, um, it's just every region of the country is a little bit different out West and down South is different from how they do things up North, um, Florida, Miami. Um, it's, it, it's not what you would think where they're always snatching and grabbing people and sending them overseas that does happen to a large number of our our people but um it's the kids you see every day get off the bus go in the house maybe have some dinner and then they leave those kids are expected to go to school perform as normal and then they go with someone in the evening or at night to be assaulted basically um they are living normal everyday lives but being trafficked right under our noses and that's why if I don't see siblings together I work in a really rough inner city community um, my office is smack dab in a town a little community they call little Afghanistan because it is really violent there it's really bad um, but that's where I need to be you know as a Christ follower he wasn't always at the temple he was a lot of times out in the trenches so that's where I felt I needed to be. And, um, you know, my office is definitely in the trenches. Um, but if I don't see the siblings together, I'm like, where's your sister? Or where's your little brother? Oh, they're having a sleepover at the neighbor's house. Mm -mm. No, sleepovers are absolutely not permitted. No, you know, let me go talk to your mama. <laughs> um, we're finding that moms are renting their kids out because they need drugs or they need rent money or some reason um, is causing them, the offer was enticing. You know, the offer, I heard of a situation yesterday where the mother of three children just died of brain cancer at 1230 in the afternoon. And this old geezer promised the family pizza and stuff like that if they would send some inappropriate sexual content on the children to him. So while I'm working on that, <laughs> Um, the kids are also going to get their pizza because that's ridiculous and extremely unfair. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that 
you may not know about unless you start having conversations with people, unless you start asking people. Um, it, that was really out of line and that, but that's how this stuff starts. You know, they see somebody down on their luck, like a dad with three little kids. The mom literally just died. What's he going to do? How's he going to feed all these kids? You know, it, it's stressful. And I believe they were with the aunt at the time. So they approached the aunt. I don't think they would do that if he was, if they were with the father, but um, that's how a lot of this starts. So um, if, if you notice anything out of the ordinary, just be aware. And the best thing you can do is find out what's in your area. And if you just don't know what's out there and you don't find anything, um, create something, you know, create a, um, not a watch group, but like a, even a Facebook page for your area that says, hey, if you guys need help, I get so many calls on Facebook. I had a domestic violence victim, um, survivor. Um, she was a victim at the time because she was still there, but survivors are when they get out, okay? So survivors are the ones who make it out. Um, but she was at the house. Of course, he took her cell phone, her keys, her bank card, so she couldn't leave. That's very standard, very typical. But she's really smart. She knew how to get a hold of me on her smart TV. She was messaging me on Facebook through her smart TV. And my team has a two-hour radius. So we, there's few of us but we will cover a large territory so we can take care of as many as we can possibly reach. And so we went to her and um, we're able to get her and her baby out. Um, the mistake she made was telling him that help was on the way because he lost it. He lost it. He realized, Oh, okay. She's leaving this time. She's really leaving and um, taking my baby and everything. And so she she caught a beating before we got there um knocked the baby out of her arms onto the floor we were on the phone with her we heard the whole thing so hoping that in the future i can stress to our clients do not tell them that you're leaving um but and domestic violence clients are a bit different from human trafficking with clients human trafficking clients never have their children um domestic violence victims usually do have their children. So the trafficking victims, if they are bred by their trafficker, um, that child is usually immediately sold um, or removed from the mother. Um, it's pretty sick, but that's one way to get younger and younger victims um, because the children are what they're after, the innocence, the purity, the children. Um, so we're just out there constantly, you know, in people's faces. Um, sorry, my phone is <laughs> very old. It's doing its own thing. Um, but we just want to get the word out and let people know that there is help out here. You don't have to stay there. It, like any of my clients, when you're ready to go, call me. Don't call me if you're just going to go back you know, because we put a hold on our lives to go do this. We put our lives on the line to go do this because it's usually, it can be confrontational sometimes. So don't jump out there trying to help people without training. Um, I can provide more training. You can get training from these other agencies. There's lots and lots of agencies around the country and opportunities to learn how to safely do this business um, because it's, it's, to me, it's a job. I can't not do this. You know, I, I have to go do this. Now that I know about it, I just, I have to go do this. I cannot ignore the fact that Cincinnati, Ohio, where I live, is number one in the country for child sex trafficking and number five overall for trafficking. So we have a lot of work to do here. Despite all the work that my team has been doing, we still have a lot of work to do here. Um, I'm sure if you look up your numbers, wherever you're at in the country, they're not going to be pretty either. It is happening literally everywhere, every community. Um, join Facebook groups, find, find these um, programs like Operation Underground Railroad, the Salvation Army, and Slavery has a couple different locations around the country. Um, Polaris Project. Polaris Project is great for statistics. I don't know the numbers. I don't have time to worry about that. We, we can talk as we go. I just want to get there to the client and get them out of there and make sure nothing else happens to them. Um, so that's, that's my goal. Um, I, I don't know all the statistics, but they're out there on Polaris. 
Um, I believe I have links still to, on my website. Um, and yeah, I, I'm talking a little fast. I'm sorry, because I know I have to go help this domestic violence client. Um, I've got some water for him. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I hope that you, you take this to heart and you really um, spend some time looking into your own community and considering getting involved if, if it speaks to you, there's not enough of us out here doing this. So it gets a bit tiring, but um, if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to, to answer any questions you have. Um, if there's anything specific you need to know or like to know, feel free to ask. Um, but that's probably all I've got at the moment. <laughs> Thank you so much. Paulette, I, um, I know for sure I have questions. And if you guys have questions, you can either type it in the chat or you can uh, raise your hand and you can ask Paulette herself, um, yourself. But I will start off and ask the question, which is the first question I had when I met you was, you know, this is such a problem. Why is it that you as a civilian, that you're the one that's, that's doing this on your own? Why is the police not? the one that the um that the trafficking are calling for them to come rescue them um there is a national human trafficking hotline number it is it blows up i mean there's we're in an epidemic of this there's the numbers are incredible i mean you're talking about about millions of people every year um so there is no way that law enforcement can handle this load um they need all the help they can get and I'm a civilian, but I'm a well-trained civilian. Um, I have a system. You know, we've done this for a long time. We know what we're doing. And a lot of times we can work in conjunction with the police. I have no problem working with the police. Um, if, if they want us to go, we'll go. There's been situations where we got someone out that they couldn't get out. Um, and there's been times where we had to call them because the logistics, we can't get in safely to get anybody out. So um, they get them out, we handle the rest. But um, yeah, law enforcement is overwhelmed. And a, there, there is anti-human trafficking training for law enforcement, but not everyone is trained in it. I don't know if it's voluntary or mandatory, but it doesn't seem like everyone gets the same training. <clears throat> wow. So, so with that being said, what is the, what, what are the steps of, of getting help? So the person is in danger, they find uh, your number, either if you're at the motel via the bar soaps, but what are the other ways that they find you? And then what are the steps for them to get rescued? Um, some people find me on Urban Success website. It's just urbansuccessmentoring.org. There's different ways to get a hold of me there. Um, on Facebook, I'm Paulette Usmo, U-S-M-O, for Urban Success Mentoring Organization. Um, they can reach me there. I, I can give you my cell phone number. I can give you my email to blast out to anybody who wants it. I can send you some paperwork out if you want. Um, but usually it's not the client that finds us. It's their family that finds us because they haven't had any satisfaction with any other agency that they've dealt with. Um, you know, and sometimes we can help them. Sometimes I refer people to the FBI because I can't help from that distance, from that far away. Um, so they have to go, you know, talk to the FBI. Local police departments are going to be overwhelmed. I like the human trafficking hotline and I like um, the FBI in the area. But um, yeah, it's not always, it's, in fact, it's rarely, if ever, the victim of trafficking that gets a hold of us. It's the family that say, oh, I spotted my loved one. You know, I spotted her somewhere or I heard she's somewhere. Will you go see? And we show up and it never fails. They always come with us, always. I've never had anybody say, no, I'm good. So I'm still so, I'm, I, I'm always so intrigued when I hear this. So you, you know, you're not, you're not that tall. We're about the same height. <laughs> so you show up, you know, you're this cute little woman. You show up to the door and these people are, basically criminals like they they're criminals in the home and you just knock on the door and yep. what do you say to get the girl to come with you or the child to come with you i am five four and a half thank you <laughs> um but it doesn't take a whole lot honestly um it 
each situation is different. There are some that are definitely more, more nerve wracking than others and more harder to navigate than others. Um, it can take hours. We have to be very patient. We can sit outside somewhere for hours, waiting on an opportunity just to talk to her or see her, her move inside the house. Um, but honestly, a lot of times I kind of feel like David and I'll take my little slingshot, my cell phone, <laughs> and I'll knock on the door and I'll literally ask for her. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but um, I'll say, oh God, there you are. You know, I've been, I can look a little street myself. I went, we've been out all day pounding the pavement, especially I can, I'm sweaty, I look dirty, I do not, yeah. Um, so I'll just knock on the door and kind of act like her long lost friend. Like I've been looking everywhere for you. What you doing here, let's go. You know, we got to get going. So very random, very non-threatening. Um, I'm just here to get her home, okay? You know, I'm just here to, to get her out of here because we have plans or something. Um, that works so many times, um, but I don't suggest anybody try that without talking to me first or a lot of street experience. Um, and you don't go by yourself. Um, I, we work in a team. So I always have at least two guys with me because, you know, I'm the talker. Um, I can't, I'm not the protector. I'm, I'm the talker. So um, if I can get her out or the child out or him out, whatever, um, you know, I've got a great mouthpiece, but it's their job to make sure we all get back to the car in one piece. So um, you don't go alone. That's, my biggest thing, at least a team of three, at least, because, um, you know, you, you have to get home to your family as well. And when you start talking about trafficking, you're taking away their money. You know, this girl is probably bringing in several thousand dollars in one night and you want to take her somewhere, you know, that doesn't go over very well. So you, you, you really have to do a lot more research, um, homework, get out there with a group who's already doing it, see how you can help, um, see how you can get involved. So as far as your, your safety, um, mm -hmm. like you were saying, it's, it's very dangerous, this aspect of it. How are you navigating mm -hmm. through that? Um, a lot of prayer. <laughs> I live by God will go before me. <laughs> I'm counting on him being there before me, knocking on that door. Um, you know, Isaiah 6, 8, you just, you got to go sometimes. You got to go, you got to go. Um, so I, I don't really worry about my safety because this makes me so angry. They should probably be afraid of me by the time I get there because this stuff is evil. It is absolutely a spiritual warfare tool that the devil is using to destroy our children. Um, it makes me angry. By the time I get there, I wish they would. I really wish I'm five four, but you're not gonna know it. Okay, you're not gonna know it because I am just so angry that anyone thinks they can enslave another human being for their pleasure, for their money. It's not okay. Absolutely not okay because these girls, boys, they come if we if they do survive this, they are so damaged. They all have dissociative disorder with as many as seven different personalities that you have to navigate and figure out who you're talking to every day. Um, so it's, it's a lot for them to try to recover. And honestly, there's very few of them. It doesn't matter if they were trafficked for a week or a year, very few of them can obtain semi-normal lives and kind of go on where they left off. It is devastating. To the survivors so it's not fair and it's not prostitution um these people are under threat that their family is going to be killed that their younger sister is going to be sold um if you don't cooperate you're going to watch someone be killed i've had that happen where a girl did not cooperate and she had to watch her best friend be killed um because they took both of them um you know there's situations just i mean it's a lot it's a lot It'll, you, you have to really put on the armor of God and have 
a seriously strong therapist in, in line because um, every once in a while you need to, to focus on your own mental health. This stuff will get to you. Um, it, it will get to you. It, after so many bloody noses and broken ribs and naked girls running to you, to your car, um, it's a lot to handle. So you need a great support system for yourself and you need to take those mental health breaks. So I, I see some uh, questions coming in. So I'm gonna jump over to the questions, but mm -hmm. I just have another one as far mm -hmm. as, so after you uh, rescue them, you physically mm -hmm. rescue them, you take them away from being um, you know, in immediate danger, what mm -hmm. happens next? Um, the first thing we do is go to the closest trafficking trained ER. That is critical because when they label my client as a prostitute, my client will bolt out the door because they know they're going to be mistreated and treated very badly. Um, here in Cincinnati, we have a fabulous ER, University of Cincinnati. They know what they're doing. They are trained by the best trafficking nurses. Um, they, that's where I go. I will drive from wherever to get there because that is the best. As long as they're not severely hurt. Um, one girl we got out, she was, she was pretty much dying. Um, so we had to go to a different ER and they did not, they didn't handle it well. So I'm forever just going to go to UC. Um, but the first step is always medical attention because they're probably going to have sprains from resisting or being restrained. They're going to have possibly broken bones, um, STDs, because they're not allowed to shower. They're not allowed to clean up in between Johns usually. Um, so a lot of STDs, a lot of STDs, um, even in the children. So medical attention, absolutely first. I carry clothes and blankets in my car, as well as water and some crackers and stuff, because some of the, our girls, if they can run, they will run with nothing on. And, um, you know, we need to cover them up and protect their modesty. But, um, you know, I keep extra stuff in my car at all times, as well as a first aid kit, a, a trauma kit. So if she's bleeding, we can stop the bleeding. Um, but first step is medical attention, then detox because you can't start to heal from this kind of trauma if you're still high, if you're still on the drugs, it's gotta come out of your system. So we gotta get them into a detox facility that is also trafficking trained. And then you get them into therapy. And this has to change from 30 or 60 or 90 days to long-term. Like our first trafficking survivor, we dealt every day, a year, for ev every day for a year with her. Um, we had to be hands on with her every single day because she had to learn that not every guy that comes in the room is going to expect you to take your clothes off or do something to you. Um, I can, you know, train and kickbox with my team members who are bigger than me and they're not going to hurt me. Um, there's so many life skills that they have to learn that they miss um, or that they forget that it takes a lot in included in that therapy. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. It's, I mean, yeah. every time you hear it, like you were saying, it just makes you so upset that this is going on. Yeah. Um, I saw, I saw a question. Mm -hmm. um, so for anyone that hopped on a little later, I know you mentioned when you first got on, but what got you into this ministry? What, what got you started? Um, Isaiah 6, 8 always puts me in trouble, <laughs> you know, um, like God's like, oh, where are we going? Who's going to go for us? I'll go, you know, I'll go. Open my big mouth, insert foot. Um, when you say you're going to do something, God will take you at your word. He'll take you seriously, but he'll also provide for you to go do that. So I didn't realize where it would go when I started working with the gang members in the public schools here, um, but God knew I would need them not only for my clients, but to get me out of a domestic violence um, when I was stuck and could not get away from my ex-husband. Um, so that's really where all this started. I started friending gang members and you know, working in really rough inner city community. And then they helped me 
you know, they returned the favor. They helped me. And that just, once we realized we were talking, like, I can't be the only one, you know, we got to do something. They're like, yeah, we got to do something. I'm like, okay, let's tell, so let's tell people that we're going to help them the way you guys helped me because they didn't just get me away from him. They protected me after that. And they stayed with me 24 hours a day. And sometimes my, my team members will stay with our clients 24 hours a day and make them feel safe. We escort them to court. We take them to the doctor's appointments. We do whatever we can do so that they feel safe. I have one girl we got out. She wouldn't let me leave the room. She was hot on my heels. She did not want to be left alone anywhere. She could not, she was terrified to be left alone. So if I went anywhere, she was with me. Um, but these guys provide comfort. They provide protection and safety. You just, you know, you can relax around them. Um, they're safe to be with. And that's what helps our clients, you know, really get through because they're strong and they're intimidating looking. They're scary looking, but they're the good guys. And they do a lot of good in this community that they don't ever get credit for. Um, saving my life is top on that list for sure. And then saving our clients. Um, they just, they do it because they know it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I can attest to that. Um, Paulette, came, <laughs> she came with one of the guys when, um, when I was in Ohio and I met him and he's like, you know, he's this big guy, but he's super sweet. He's only, you know, he's only angry when he needs to be. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to, protect the, to protect those that can't protect themselves. So, yeah. so uh, I'm going to ask, the next question, um, how can I recognize signs of victims in a school setting? Um, cutters. Cutters are a big sign. If you have a girl who's wearing a turtleneck in August, she's probably cutting herself. Um, anyone that doesn't make eye contact, they ask for permission to do everything because they're so restricted in that dynamic, in that setting. Um, they have to ask for permission to do anything, even leave a room. Um, uh, someone who, you know, sometimes they have explosive tendencies. You'll say the slightest thing and they're like, or you'll come up to them and they'll jump 10 feet from you. You know, um, one of our clients, I took one of my team members with me, sweet as a teddy bear. I mean, just a teddy bear, but he's six, five. And she, um, oh, sorry. Um, she saw us coming down the hallway and she just backed up against the hallway because she didn't know what to expect if you see fear reactions out of people um isolation is another one not having their own money not having their own id um if they don't have their own um you know cell phone they're only given a cell phone for certain reasons or certain times um you know those are all some some indication somebody who's never home you know, if you, if you see all the other kids are at home, but this one child in particular is never here. They're always with so-and-so. Why are they always with so-and-so? I remember you mentioning um, different places where people go to pick up these children. So uh, mm -hmm. I never look at public storage facilities or Walmarts or yeah. Red Roof in uh, the same way again. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, the public storage facilities are more out west. There's some really good documentaries and films. One that I really like is Eden. It's on YouTube, I believe. E D E N. Um, she was taken from a date, like from a bar, and taken to a public storage facility. This happens out west mostly, down south, out west, like Texas. Um, but they keep the girls in a public storage facility until they're called for until they're ready to go um but that that's just one example um red roof inn for whatever reason is kind of famous for doing trafficking as well um we go over there a lot even in good communities if you have a red roof inn in your community um yeah there's there's a strong possibility especially motel six red roof Inn. those two in particular are pretty pretty well known for having multiple rooms dedicated to trafficking. I walked into a motel here with my little soaps and I was so happy to talk to the manager and give them this soap. And I saw the look on their faces. 
and they're making way too much money for me to give them soaps. So I just took my soap and I backed right out of the place. And I found out later that it got raided by the U.S. Marshals. Hmm. Sorry about your luck. I <laughs> shouldn't do evil stuff for money. Um, but that's just me. What about, what about Walmarts? That always stuck with me when you said that. Oh, Walmart. I wish I knew an executive of Walmart. I'll never understand why they put the toy section in front of the bathrooms and next to the hunting and sporting goods section. Because guess what? You get these trafficking handlers who are stationed at different places. They will grab an edged weapon, like a, a knife of any kind, any size, from the rack because it's open at the sporting goods section and they'll watch for a child who's unsupervised in the toy section. They'll take that child into the bathroom, cut their hair, change their clothes. And now that we have these freaking masks, they put a little piece of duct tape over their mouth and the mask over their face and they go out the front door. I wish I was kidding. I just saw that comment. I wish I was kidding. We have taken kids back to Walmart to re-familiarize them and help them feel safe shopping at Walmart again because they were attacked. And you have to have a safety plan. My kids know if a trafficker approaches you, the odds are they're gonna panic if you get loud, if you scream. So scream your head off, run to security, run to the customer service desk. If there's no reason my child should not be with me. Um, if we get separated, we do Marco Polo. So I yell Marco, they yell Polo, and we just wait. They, they wait for me to catch up to them. But my child's hand stays on the cart. My hand stays on my child because they tag team in stores. And one person will take a picture of the child they want, send it to the other person who will come and distract the parent. It, they've got a method to their madness. That's why they're so successful um, at this. But I need the word to get to Walmart move the toy section just move the toy section you don't have to move the bathrooms and the sporting goods section but please move the toy section put it up front where there's a lot more traffic because it's back in the back you you go you you intentionally go there you know and if if you're not intentionally there yeah you know, i mean i've seen parents leave their kids in the toy section to play while they go do other things that's not okay that's not okay wow it's it's i mean you're the first person that I heard this from when I was hearing it, like you were saying, I wish that it was something that, you know, you just see on a movie, but it's real life and it's happening right under our noses. And um, there's more questions. So I'll ask the next one, but uh, I do, I do want to ask. So not everyone is equipped to, you know, do what you do. You um, you're literally a superhero. So, cause you know, how in the movies, they have a regular nine to five and then at night they're fighting crime. <laughs> That's literally what you're doing. Um, so not yeah. everyone is equipped necessarily to like go to the door per se, but right. for me, like right. what can I do? Like how can I help in mm -hmm. um, once they are rescued? What can mm -hmm. I do, you know, in that, within that? Oh my goodness. Um, literally anybody can do what I do. You, you really, it's nothing. You, you just got to be willing to go do it. And sometimes my temper gets the best of me and I'm just not going to put up with it anymore. <laughs> um, but um, it's funny because people, there was a group in my city years back running around intercepting crime with superhero capes on. And I could not convince people that it wasn't us. It wasn't us. We're not dressing up as superheroes, um, but there was a group doing that. <laughs> so um, we, we, we do work day jobs and have families and we just, we do this every day as often as we can, um, as much as we can, our clients we talk to as much as we can. But for those who don't want to go out and do the rescue, you gotta be, you gotta have some thick skin. It's not for everybody, I know. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. It'll take a toll on you. So what you can do is you can support those who go. You can support them financially. You can support them through spreading the word like this. You've set up fabulous opportunities for more people to learn about what's going on here. That is 
something that I can't do. I don't know how to do this Zoom stuff. I know how to do the street stuff. I don't know how to do the Zoom stuff that you did. Um, so this is incredible. You know, any kind of support you can offer an agency, um, you know, spread the word, have the soaps made. Um, I pay a dollar for all of my soaps. Um, um, you know, anything you can come up with to, to do, these clients need mentors. Um, there's a wonderful program here. It's called Change Court, and it's run by Judge Heather Russell. Um, she works with trafficking survivors who have um, criminal records. Obviously, you're going to have a criminal record as a, a trafficker um, victim, but um, she gives them mentors. So you partner with a mentor for two or three years, and you learn how to go grocery shopping. You learn how to pay bills. You learn how to apply for jobs. These are things that these women need and men need um, that they don't get. You know, they need to be told that it's okay to, you know, enjoy life, to be happy, to, you know, go to the store on your own. Um, I would say the best thing you could probably do is connect with a local agency, see what's missing. Can you fill in the gap with something? Um, you know, what is needed in your community? And, you know, continue to spread the word, continue to tell everybody you can. Awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna um, read the next one. And it says, what are the best resources to receive the needed training to work with a victim? So you mentioned a few if you could mention those again and some other um, resources that that you know of. Um, I love the Salvation Army's training. They they do a great job. That's where I first got my training. Um, after my first encounter with a survivor. <laughs> um, I did it backwards. Don't do it backwards. It's harder that way. Um, but go to the Salvation Army, go to the Attorney General and find out, um, you know, which agencies in your area are on the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force and see how you can get involved with them. Okay. Okay. So, um, there's something, even though you're based in Ohio, mm -hmm. um, there's something mm -hmm. that everyone can do whatever neck of the woods there they are and is there a way to partner with you even though people are in different states and different even a different country absolutely absolutely i have teams in eight different states right now we are growing because the more i do on social media the more requests for help come in and i don't have a team everywhere so if you want to start a team in your area let me know um, we can definitely work on that um, we, we need everybody we can, all hands on deck, really. It requires a lot um, to get this done. So, um, you know, right now I have teams in eight states. Each team has a two-hour service radius, and we're hoping to grow, but it really kind of depends on where the needs are as to where I recruit the next team, um, you know, or, and I got to know about, I got to know about the needs, you know. Um, I don't know what's going on in Vermont or, um, you know, Iowa, I, I'm aware of where my teams are and Cincinnati, of course. Okay. So what about, so what about church settings? Mm -hmm. um, is it something that's happening inside the church? And if it is, like, what are some kind of <clears throat> signs um, mm -hmm. that you can look out for to maybe say something? Um, yes. I worked with a, a girl who was trafficked by an elder of her church, I'm trying to turn some light on so you guys can see me, sorry, it's getting dark here. Um, she was actually trafficked by an elder of her church. Um, approach your men's group, approach your pastor, see if they are open to um, hearing about human trafficking in your area, see if they're aware of anyone in the congregation who is struggling with sex addiction, porn addiction, um, unusual fetishes, things like that, that might indicate that they've either engaged in trafficking or are considering um, spending money on a trafficking, you know, um, situation. Um, because churches will, they will get active, but they need someone to lead that. A lot of them are not yet open. I'm, I'm making arrangements to go speak to some different churches here soon because we're doing a fundraiser next month and I want the churches to come out and see us and you know um, talk to us. But um, I think they shy away from it 
because it's such a, a sticky topic. You know, the buyers are everywhere. Somebody is spending money. The, the business is $150 billion a year that's coming from somebody's pockets. And you probably know somebody who, is, who has spent some money and they just don't want to say it. Um, but you've got to, it took me a while to get my church behind us, but because they really couldn't believe that, you know, one, we're out here doing this and helping people and two, it's so bad here. So you've got to show them some information, some statistics, different things to kind of get them have multiple conversations with them, maybe speak to the men's breakfast group or something, um, try to get them on board slowly. I actually love that. So I know, I know a lot of people, a lot of young people in particular that have asked like, Hey, I want to, you know, I want to start something like step, start a ministry or something like that in my church, get involved in church, but nothing is really like kind of grabbing my attention. And I, some people have mentioned that this is something that they would like to do to start. So what is, I guess the process that they would, you know, get it started. So you go to, you know, do you go to the pastor um, the board, how do you go about that process and what do you tell them? Um, every church is different with my church. Um, they give me opportunities to speak to the congregation. Um, they've made videos of us and they'll play the videos. Sometimes they do a tree for us every year and, um, people can donate gift cards or I have a list of people who need specific things. And my church members will take the list and they'll buy stuff for us and put it under the tree. Um, but, you know, I don't know, you could say, hey, we wanna start a small group, a small study group. Let's figure out, you know, what Jesus would think about trafficking. Where would he be? I happen to think Jesus would be sitting right next to me because he does not like people hurting his children. He does not like evil. So I think, you know, the churches should be more open to it um because it, it's what we're supposed to do is go help people so if you start a conversation slowly um you know with your church hopefully eventually it'll lead to them being willing to do a small group or an event you know have a booth set up at their next um summer event you know my church does a lot of outdoor stuff we have movie nights um once a week and you know sometimes i can set up a booth um we have a little mini camp and we have many death camps so this year i was a speaker at death camp and um got to tell all the deaf people about the risks and what to look for and hear some stories that they've already experienced um, because they didn't know nobody told them nobody gave them a safety plan or told them where to be careful or gave them any warning signs so you know, just do your best to have these conversations and um, look at other outreach programs and see what they're doing. Just, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just do what they're doing, copy what they're doing. If they offer like us, we have teams in other places, you know, you can join us, you can start a chapter maybe of um, end slavery or something like that. So, you know, figure out what you really want to do within the trafficking realm. There's plenty to do <laughs> you know if you have cyber skills if, if you have the ability to make soap i have to buy my soap that we take to the hotels um whatever your skills are you know use them i have um so so paulette initially she was going to do this in her office but she's actually in her car right now because she had a call and she had to go and help the person so you're essentially on call. Is it 24 seven? Whenever someone needs help, you go help them. Unfortunately, this is not a Monday through Friday, nine to five. They're coming to my office type of thing. If they could get away, they would, and they wouldn't need us. So it never fails. It's a weekend, usually in the night, during the night, um, when somebody goes to the bathroom and they're able to get to a phone or they're able to get out a door, um, something like that. So yes, we allow ourselves to be on call 24 seven, because if I remember right, it was pretty late at night when I called one of my all time favorite gang members and said I needed his help. And he said, I'm there. So he came for me and he brought help. He brought back up with him um, to protect me. And it was probably two in the morning. 
So we can do that for someone else. Um, we're very willing to go out in the middle of the night. And that is a lot of times when you need to be out because that's when they are out. You know, they sleep during the day a lot of times. That's when they're out or they go to doctor's appointments or, um, you know, uh, Planned Parenthood is what I'm learning. Planned, Planned Parenthood is a place that we may start hanging out because trafficking victims are brought in there to have abortions and stuff. Oh, and to get and, treatment. And to get treatment. So it's very interesting. So the person you're helping right now is a man. And yeah. as you were telling me, it just made me think. I don't, you know, usually you think of women and children, uh, mm -hmm. but you don't typically think of abuse victims <laughs> as men. Um, so can you kind of share a little bit about that from the kind of the male's perspective? Um, I think they feel ashamed to ask for help like they're supposed to be strong enough to handle it but no one should rightfully live in abuse that's not healthy that's not what God designed God designed us for love and he gives you a, a partner to love and to be loved so when that partner starts being abusive and will not change their ways they're just really revealing who they were all along um, women can absolutely be narcissistic um, it's time to go. And I've been telling this guy, you know, she made you get rid of the couch. So you had to sleep on the floor because she won't let you in the bed. And she's making you ride your bike to work or walk to work instead of driving the car that you actually own. And she's not letting you have any of your money that you work for every day when she stays home. Mm, does that seem abusive? And she yells at him. And I mean, just there's a whole lot more. But um, he finally today decided he had had enough he was done and he's got a great support system um, with us. You know, we're, we're here for him. Um, he called me probably about five o'clock and said he was leaving the house. His boss let him borrow a van and he's going to the storage unit and he's gonna get all of his stuff first out of storage so that when she loses her mind tomorrow, realizing that he's done and he's not coming home and she destroys his stuff in the house, she doesn't also destroy his stuff in the storage unit because that's all his military stuff. Um, he's a veteran. He served our country. He fought in, I don't remember how many um, um, things he told me, how many situations he was in, but like, this is not how we treat our veterans and this is not how we treat our partners. So I wish more men would come forward. Um, I have big team members, I have little team members. Some of my big team members know that they call the cops they're going to jail no matter what happened to them because you know she's the little one and they're the big one it it needs to change you know there's a lot of stereotypes um i'm glad he called i hope he tells all of his friends that they're in a situation they can call us too you know you don't have to live like that it's not fair yeah i love that and um i see a hand raised uh stay yes. here Yes, um, I do have a question. Hi, how are you? Hi. Um, so I think, I mean, I had a question about, um, I think NPR was trying to help me, but I'm still kind of lost. So what did you mean about, because I hear you keep talking about like, I'm giving out soaps, I'm giving out soaps, I'm giving out soaps. So what do you mean? Like, what, what's the point of that? Um, I have a food pantry in this little violent neighborhood that I work in. So one way that we connect with people is to give out a lot of food. But if they can't get to us, one another way that we connect and we try to find, like if my phone doesn't ring for help every so often, like mm -hmm. I start getting like anxious. I'm like, okay, why isn't anybody calling me? We'll go find somebody who needs help, right? So mm -hmm. one way we do that, I don't think I have any in the car. Um, I have these little soaps. It's basically a lot of oil with a phone number on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I go to hotels, uh, strip clubs, truck stops, anywhere that we know prostitution slash trafficking is happening. And I'll say, could you give this soap out to anybody you may know who needs it? I'll tell that to the desk okay. clerk or um, the cashier at the truck stop, or um, I'll ask a girl to leave the, you know, I can't go into a strip club. I'm like, here, leave this in the bathroom for me. You know, um, so we have little soaps and they have our, my phone number on it. Mm -hmm. my google voice phone number not my real phone number right. but my google voice phone number um and that way if somebody calls me i know that's off of that soap and we can be ready to go help that person 
Got it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It is a great idea, but it's also a problem because now trafficking handlers have caught on because every street outreach organization is using soaps and they know that if they see somebody with a soap that doesn't look like the hotel soap, it's probably mm. a health soap. And now we've got to switch to like a matchbox or, um, oh. you know, a, a lipstick container with a phone number on it. Some other thing that they're not More clued settled. in about yet. Yeah. Okay. They're, yeah. they're smart. They're very smart. I did not think they were this smart. I didn't give them that much credit, but mm. wow, they make it um, hard. Thank you so much for that information. Thank you. Thanks. Um, what are some, I know I asked you this, what are some of the needs that you have, um, that you guys have? Um, well, we're doing a fundraiser next month because we have got to start buying our own property. Um, by the time I get somebody out, it may have already been four or five hours. Then we go to the ER, it's going to be another four to eight hours. And after that, I've got to get them, depending on if they keep them in a locked unit for us or they release them to us. You know, I've got to get them into a detox facility. That is exhausting and that's expensive. It's costing us a fortune to do that. What I want to do is buy our own house and have it staffed 24 seven with a nurse. So when we get somebody out, we can take them directly to this nurse who provides the medical attention. We have a detox person or um, I don't know a whole lot about addiction. I'm still learning because it just, I'm, I don't know a lot about addiction, but all of our clients are addicted. So I want the medical attention. I want at four in the morning, I got to work the next day. I'm going to be up for 36 hours. I need to drop this person off at my house to my nurse to get them taken care of. She'll send them up to the second floor to get detox. And then once that's out of their system, we'll deal with the, the trauma therapy and then move them into a phase where they rebuild their lives. Um, so we need to start acquiring property. That's probably our biggest need right now is property. Um, it can be literally anywhere. It shouldn't be where they're trafficked. It really shouldn't. People have offered me houses in the same community that I got the girl out of. I'm like, you know, no, I, I can't do that because then I'll have a problem because um, her traffickers are going to come back. Um, so we need to buy houses and just handle it all in-house ourselves. Um, a lot, not a lot, but sometimes we find that the trafficking handlers significant others are working their way into shelters, domestic violence and trafficking, and they snitch. I had a girl kidnapped from a domestic violence shelter once, and it was not good, but there was a rat in the shelter, and she was feeding the traffickers information like, hey, so-and-so is here, so-and-so is here now, and they went and they took her out of the shelter. It was terrifying. It was really bad. So I want people in my house that I vet and I trust and I know um, because that's what they're doing now is getting them from shelters. Um, and that's not okay. So our biggest need is always going to be property um, and then gas money to get to court, <laughs> gas money to go do rescues. Um, we all work jobs. This is a nonprofit. I don't have a grant writer. I don't know how to do fundraisers. Somebody from church who we rescued um, his daughter and her friend last year. He's putting on a fundraiser for us this year. Um, and uh, he's, he's pretty badass. He was kind of meant for this. He's not, he's fearless. So <laughs> I would love for him to maybe join the team. Um, but you know, anything the, the, your client, anything you have in your home, we say our client needs in their home, because when they do get their own room somewhere, or, you know, if they are high functioning enough to get an apartment at some point, they're going to need all this stuff. So we collect a lot of home goods as well. So just keep that in mind for your local shelters that maybe they need dressers and hangers and, um, you know, women's hygiene products. Sometimes we'll go out with a bag of hygiene products and just, you know, hand them out and my soap and my card is in there. So, so how are you able to afford all of this? Is it like out of pocket expenses? A lot of it is. We get very little monetary donations. We get things that we ask for, like um, somebody will buy me a hundred soaps or somebody will provide a mattress that I need. Um, 
but a lot of it comes out of our own pocket. I'm not good at fundraising. So, and I, I don't have grant writer money. So, um, I need to take some time to try to find like a, a college student who's going into the field who may want to be an intern for us and help me with some of this stuff. Cause I do real estate to fund all of this. I do, um, a little bit of real estate. I don't do a whole lot because, you know, this takes up a lot of my time. <laughs> so, um, you know, but that's generally between that and the sign language interpreting how we pay for everything. Uh, so if there's anyone on here that would, you know, want to be an intern, please reach out. Um, also, if you are a part of a church and, you know, we run, we're in a Zoom era right now. So there's a lot of Zoom meetings going on. Maybe talk to your church or your youth group to see uh, if they would be interested in having Paulette come and talk about it, grow some awareness. Um, and also um, just, just uh, support as much as possible. Um, I really, really do believe as Christians, especially, this is something that we all should in some way be involved in, even if we're not necessarily the ones going from door to door, you know, taking the people, but at some, at some point down the line, uh, we all should be, you know, form a community together to help these people mm -hmm. that are in need. Yes. It's going to take all of us. It, this isn't just for law enforcement. A lot of people criticize us because outside of my survivors that kind of advise us, we, like you said, we're civilians, but we're Christians. So it is our job. It is our business. Our neighbor is our business, you know? So it, it's, people criticize us because we're not pastors, cops, or social workers, but I don't see them doing it. You know, I don't see them, you know, they're just, they can't figure out why we're doing this, how we're doing this so su successfully. And they just think it's ridiculous. But in my mind, I need everybody on board because if we start fighting back and we reduce demand, you know, it, that's the key. We want to reduce demand. We want to reduce supply. So we've got to talk to these guys who are buying the children and fix, heal whatever we can that's within them, causing them to, to want to do this so that we don't have as many damaged children to work with and, and to heal from trauma. So it's kind of a, a two-part project. You know, you've got to go after the buyers and stop the buyers, but you've also got to go get the ones that are already out here being sold. And I have one more question. So I remember you saying this, why is it that you can't necessarily take someone that has just been rescued and bring them to your home? Oh, <laughs> I did that. Don't ever do that. Um, don't ever do that because they need trained care, round the clock care, 24 seven, maybe that is temporarily in a psych unit until you can get a bed in a trafficking shelter. But this girl that I brought to my house, I didn't know what else to do with her. And there was nothing available. There was no bed. And at the time, I didn't know about the stuff that was two, three, four hours around us. So now I'll drive if I have to. But before I just brought her to my house and she, that's when I really got a firsthand experience with dissociative disorder. Um, she was a pyromaniac. She almost burned the house down and she was a cutter and she kept cutting herself really badly. Um, I couldn't get her into therapy because there was, I didn't have the resources in place at the time. Um, I just knew that I didn't want her raped again. I didn't want her, her brother coming in her room again, putting ice up her and down her pants and doing all this stuff to her that is setting her mind off you know, to where it doesn't need to be. So my only concern was to get her out. And I didn't have a plan for after that. I didn't have any resources for after that. Um, so we had to work very quickly to create resources. But another thing, another reason is you don't want anybody knowing where she's at. If they have tracking equipment on her, you don't want them showing up at your house. Let them show up at the hospital where they have security and police um because you don't want them on my house yeah okay but you know um you don't want them showing up at your house 
you don't want traffickers showing up at your house. Not a good situation. I saw um, I saw a hand again. So here, do you have yeah. a, another question? Yes, yes, this is my mom. <laughs> Um, I have a very good, uh, I, I think I'm kind of like when you go to somebody's house, call it, and then, um, you go wherever you go to rescue one girl or a man, whatever, or boy. Um, and I see you have to play to get this kid, like you nothing, you just like whatever, but I come, um, you don't work with like uh authorities to just track this place and get the place and for example just now you said you didn't want his brother so how come you didn't get the brother arrest and everything and finish everything so how come that don't work like that for um, you guys in that particular situation that girl's family was in complete denial that one she had any help outside that family um they did not acknowledge what the men in the family were doing to her. The mom knew about it. She would not acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything for them. It's like a domestic violence victim and I'm, I'm trying to take care of the, the domestic violence victim and also deal with the narcissist. A lot of people ask me, why don't you do anything for the narcissist? Mm -hmm. I can't do anything for them. They won't <laughs> admit their wrongdoing. They mm -hmm. won't acknowledge that they have hurt this person and they need some help and they're not going to stop. It's a pattern. So mm -hmm. um, I can't go after the brother. I can, I mean, directly, like I can, we filed charges. Mm -hmm. um, we did things like that. So there's appropriate channels to try to punish these people. This was a family situation. So it was a little different than going up against, say, um, you know, different organized crime groups that okay. um always get pissed off if i mention their names so i won't <laughs> say their names but um <clears throat> yeah there's there's a lot of times where that's just not an option my goal is to get them out okay. and whatever else if we can do something about it we can do something about it but okay. um these people operate so professionally like it, it's hard to take them down okay okay i see thank you you're welcome. I do remember there were, um, there's quite a few, like you were saying, um, they operate very professionally. Mm -hmm. I remember you having a list and you had a lot of resources. If anyone is interested, um, I mean, last time you came, I mean, she gave us like a whole packet of resources. If you're interested, yeah. um, you can send us your, you can email us, email newenglandyouthretreat at gmail.com. And uh, we will send you a, um, a PDF or maybe some files that uh, we'll get from Paulette. Yep. Um, but I remember you sharing uh, quite a few different ways where they'll pick up uh, young people. And some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the ways that you were sharing were some of, I encountered some when I was in college. So can you kind of <laughs> touch on a little bit? Oh. There's one, like <laughs> some people you Bible study, some people, there's mm -hmm. different ones that you would not expect. The Bible study one really boils my blood because there's nothing biblical or good about what you're gonna do to these people when they get in your van. So, we have a group traveling the country called um, <clears throat> Mother of God or Mother of Christ, where they claim to be a Bible study group, and they go to malls a lot, um, and they they go to different stores. They like Starbucks, um, they like TJ Maxx, um, but they will say, "Hey, you know, would you like to go into Bible study?" And, you know cute little missionaries like yourself. They'll send these girls out. Women recruit other women because then they don't have to be trafficked as much. So if you are being trafficked, you want to get somebody else to take your place as fast as possible, right? So you're going to go out with this Bible study um, proposal and you're going to say, oh, you know, would you like to come to Bible study? Well, sure. When is it? Right now. When have you ever heard of a Bible study going on right now and that person is not there? Okay, so well, come with me. I'll give you a brochure from my van. No, that's not happening. They will even approach girls who are with guys 
and then get their phone number and try to befriend them. It's a whole grooming process. It's not glitter doming, but it's a grooming process. So um, they'll make friends with them both. But in the end, the guy will be excluded. He won't be allowed to come with her. And that's how they keep it moving. Um, they take the girl and they disappear down the highway. Um, another way is, you know, mystery shoppers come into a store. Uh, one of our clients, Maya, she was working at a popular store here and this girl came in shopping all the time and they became friends. She's like, you're really cool. You should hang out with me. Well, that changed really quickly. That girl started talking on FaceTime to a guy in a foreign language and turned the phone around, showed him Maya and pretty soon things changed. Um, Maya was driving a brand new sports car. Um, it, it just kind of all added up. And, and finally this guy who she was turned over to was like, quit answering your phone. Don't go home. You know, you need to cut everybody off. Um, and come to find out they were, they're professional trafficking handlers that work our area. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a few creative ways. I've even heard of teenagers with little puppies in the park, trying to get little kids to help catch their puppy. And, oh man, can you just bring them back to the van for me? You know, there, it, it's, it's unbelievable how creative they get when they do this stuff. Um, I could literally talk about this all day. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, like you, you know, you hear about these things and it's hard to wrap your mind around it actually happening, but it does. So, um, so we're going to wind down. Um, but any final words for, you know, maybe if someone has children or, um, you know, even if you don't have children, but if you're out in public, some things to just, you know, keep yeah. I out for keep an eye out for other people's children. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm constantly watching everybody's kids. Um, a friend of mine who looks very young went into a Kroger store recently and was started being followed around by a little man who said, Oh, you look like my ex-girlfriend. And so she called me and I told her, drop what you're doing, get to the front of the store, ask security to walk you to your car right now. Don't hesitate to drop what you're doing and get out of there. Um, pay attention to your intuition. If you don't have a good feeling about a person, anybody who said, oh, my car ran out of gas down the street. Could you drive me to the gas station? No, I'll give you $5. You can walk to the gas station and get you some gas, walk to your car. Um, you know, be smart, street smart, common sense smart. Don't let your kids out of your sight. Don't let them out of your sight. I have GPS on my kids. Verizon Gizmo, $5, 100 bucks to buy it. You know, it's, it's the best investment ever because I didn't want my kids to have a cell phone um, where they could get on all these different, you know, websites and games and things. Um, so the Verizon Gizmo has a GPS tracker and only four phone numbers programmed into it. So it's very limited, but it's fabulous because it will go straight to wherever they're standing. Um, you know, create a safety plan, practice it. Make sure your kids have a safety word. Do the Marco Polo thing if they get separated. Um, do your best to just keep an eye out, be aware of your surroundings. I have no problem hitting, you know, calling somebody when I'm on the phone with them doing FaceTime and letting them see whoever I'm suspicious of, you know, that way, if something happens to me, they can give a physical description. The movie taken is not just Hollywood. That's real life stuff. That's brilliant. Actually. Um, there's a list of videos and movies, red light, green light, Eden taken, um, that are on my website so urbansuccessmentoring.org that has a lot of resources a lot of different um organizations and things that you can check out but educate yourself stay safe you know protect the kids around you and the people around you just be ready to help because things can jump off very quickly um but if you if you're so called to do this you know welcome to the field because it, it's it's very fast paced it's you know we need more people in the field we really do doing all kinds of things all kinds of things it doesn't have to be you know going to knock on doors like we do but um just keeping your eyes open and reporting what you see you know if you see something call the human trafficking hotline 
Thank you so much. This is, so we're going to close. This is the very last question I have for you is, okay. how are you keeping sane? <laughs> <laughs> um, I spend a lot of time with my kids. You know, I, um, I love spending time with my kids and I, um, I go to therapy every once in a while, but it has to be a very specific therapist. Not everybody can handle it. I've put therapists in therapy. Um, I had one girl I sent out with her and she's like, stop right there. I can't handle this. I'm like, okay, that's why I interview you. You know, I need to make sure that you can handle what I'm going to unload on. you. Um, it's important to go to therapy to keep your own mental health and emotions, you know, clear so that you can continue to do this because if you're not out here doing this, if you're not supporting these programs and things, who is, um, you know, it, it's, there's not a lot of people who want to do this. So um, it's important to take care of yourself, meditate, pray, do whatever makes you feel good and just kind of go with that. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, I, every time, you know, I tell people this all the time, you're probably one of the most interesting uh, people I know, but it's, <laughs> it's so amazing because literally God has called us to be his hands and feet. And that is, you know, that's how we showcase his love to people. It's mm -hmm. not all the time that we're going to have a, a chance to sit down with someone and have a Bible study, but right. it's through our interactions with them and through the love and the care and the compassion that we show them mm -hmm. that they'll be able to tangibly get to know who Jesus really is. So yeah. um, thank you so much, so much Paulette. And thank you um, for doing this. I really, really appreciate this. This is reaching far and wide places that I can't reach because I'm not tech savvy. So I joined the call, <laughs> but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if anyone's trying to get in touch with you, we know that mm -hmm. um, you, can, you can get on her website, uh, www.urbansuccessmentoring.org. Also, um, your email is, mm -hmm. what's your email? Um, urban success at outlook.net. I believe it's .net for Outlook. <laughs> um, urban success. And you can click on the website link as well. That'll go straight to me. Um, they can literally text me. Um, my phone, I think, I'm pretty sure my, my phone number is on every telephone pull around the city. But um, I don't know if you, do you want me to give them my phone number? I can do that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. it's area code 513 because it's Cincinnati. So it's 513-508-1171. That's 513-508-1171. Thank you, Miss Tech Savvy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, text me, call me, skywrite me, find me on Facebook. Um, you know, I'm happy to have more conversations, do more training, help you with a situation you're not sure about. Um, there's lots of great programs out there that you can get involved with. We just, we do things the way we do them. Um, and it seems to work for our clients. I'm sure there's some way that you can, you know, find to fit in and, and help people. You know, that, that is really what we're called to do. Amen. Amen. So even though it seems like it's widespread and it, it often seems like it's an impossible task, but, um, you know, one person at a time. <laughs> so uh, yeah. thank you so much, Literally. Paulette. And <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm say a word of prayer and, and then we can close. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity of being able to just understand uh, what is going on right under our noses. Lord, we ask for forgiveness for, um, for sometimes not being as aware of, of what your children are going through, but we thank you so much for um, your grace and your mercy. And we ask that you just prick our hearts and allow us to um, just be able to help out in whatever way that we can. We can all do the exact same thing, Lord, as far as going to doors and, and rescuing the, uh, the people that need to be rescued, Lord, but there's something that each of us can do, whether mm -hmm. it's just uh, sharing and bringing awareness mm -hmm. or keeping an eye out for other people. Lord, we thank you so much for just allowing us this, um, this opportunity of being able to uh, 
be of service uh, to your children. And I pray that you'd be with Paula and keep her safe, Father. Uh, send your angels around her to protect her for what she's doing. I know that the enemy is not happy. And I know that there are people that are not happy with her in her team, but we know that your angels are with her and in camp around her and um, she is changing lives. And I pray that we can all come together and um, be able to come into that experience as well. And I pray in Jesus's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. We really do need the protection. Oh my goodness. Um, it, the devil is not happy. You're right about that. And there's some people who've made it very clear that they're not happy, but, uh, you know, when trafficking ends, we'll stop doing this. <laughs> so, until Amen. then, looking forward to that. <laughs> until then, yeah, me too. I'd, I'd like to retire. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, that's true. Someone said we spend more money on weekly takeout. We spend a lot of money on weekly takeout. So, um, you know, I personally, I'm trying to be more mindful as well to, you know, put money yeah. aside to be able yeah. to help those in need. Uh, yeah. Thank you guys yeah. so yeah. much. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Paulette. Good night, everyone. Thank you.